Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk to you about the books I read in July 2020. It was a big reading month and it was one filled with adventure, villains, and vengeance. So let's take a look at the books. I'll start things off by talking about my absolute favorite book of the month that was One to Watch by Kate Stamen London. This book starts when a plus-sized fashion blogger very publicly on her popular blog criticizes her favorite bachelor slash bachelorette type reality show for not showcasing a wider range of body types. In response, the new showrunner for Main Squeeze, the name of this show, offers to make our main character B the next star of Main Squeeze to be the star of the next season in which a handful of men will compete for her heart. Throughout this book, not only is B attempting to choose between these men, but she's also dealing with some very relatable problems, one of which is body image. She is a very self-accepting plus-sized woman, and she is used to targeted negativity since she is already a semi-public figure because of her blog, but she still deals with body image after hearing everyone's responses to the show. And throughout the book, she's wondering whether or not these men are here for the right reasons. That's always a question on these types of reality shows. But for her, there's an extra level to it. Also, when filming starts, she's dealing with a really weird friends turned lovers then ghosting situation. So when they start off, she's not even sure she wants to commit to liking any of these guys. But then slowly, a few of them start to capture her interest. This book was so much fun. I absolutely tore through it. I will say, I think you probably need to already be a reality TV show fan before coming into it in order to get the most out of it. But it's not necessarily a requirement. It's just that you won't fully understand what it's like to be a fan of one of these shows and following along week to week. The book features transcripts from fan-made podcasts and then Slack channels of people who are watching the show together. So you really feel like you're in on the fun of watching Main Squeeze along with everybody else. You will have your favorite contestants just like they do. It's really smart too. I really love the dialogue and I thought the relationships that B develops with each of the contestants are really interesting. Each of them was very unique. Unique. This is definitely my favorite light read of the year so far. Highly recommend this one. I also read another romance book this month, The Trouble with Hating You by Sajni Patel. This book stars Leah and Jay, two young, single Indian professionals living in Texas who would have been set up on a date if Leah didn't bolt away from the dinner that their parents had set up for them. It is very much a love to hate romance, as the title probably suggests, but there is a lot of deep, dark, real world complexity to it. Both Leah and Jay are dealing with their own past traumas. And Leah has the added disadvantage of having those past traumas affect the way people see her in the present. She is actively being ostracized by their community and even by her own father, who is a real piece of work. It's all pretty heavy for a romance book, and I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about it. However, what I did really like about it was that not every element of the book had a happy ending. I know it is a requirement for the romance genre for the couple to end up together and to live happily ever after, but I did like that there were some things that just weren't able to be resolved. I like seeing in a book that a couple can be put up against adversity and work through it as a team. I root for couples like that, so that element I really liked. This one was worth a read, but it was not my favorite. Then I read two books for Jane Austen July, an event hosted by Katie from Books and Things and Marissa from Blatantly Bookish. First, I read Lady Susan by none other than Jane Austen. This is an epistolary novella about a manipulative, recently widowed woman with a bad reputation who is attempting to use her wiles to get her way in basically every situation. Even knowing that the titular character of this book was cunning when I went into it, I knew that from descriptions of it, I still was not prepared for her to be a straight up villain. She is evil. You can see how two-faced she is and how she presents herself in her letters to certain characters versus how she comports herself when she's writing to her also seemingly evil confidant. The whole time I was just like, Miss Austin, I didn't know you had this in you. It's really worth your time picking up if you haven't done so already. As I said, it's a novella, so it's extremely short, very easy to get through. And it's just fun seeing Jane Austen write a book starring a villain. 
still can't get over that. And yes, before you ask, I also did watch the adaptation, Love and Friendship, starring Kate Beckinsale, and I really liked it. And then I read a nonfiction book about Jane Austen's time. That was one of the challenges for Jane Austen July. That book was Gentleman of Uncertain Fortune by Rory Muir. This is a more academic work that looks at what became of younger sons in the Regency period, since it was only the oldest son who would inherit. The book goes profession by profession, highlighting how younger sons could have made their living by becoming a clergyman or a lawyer, for instance, and then gives real life examples of some younger sons who did that. It is an academic book, and while it was very entertaining, it definitely read as more academic, it was very thorough. I tended to like the more general discussions about family dynamics during this period, Period, then I liked the specific profession details. Like for instance, I didn't know in Jane Austen's England that when the father died and the oldest son inherited, he effectively became the head of the household, not just in his ownership, but also in his standing within the family. Like younger sons would start looking up to their oldest brother as their father. What he says goes. I don't think a casual reader would necessarily like this, but I think if you love this period of history, you might enjoy this one. I then decided very spontaneously to pick up Florence Adler Swims Forever by Rachel Beanland after I started hearing some really good buzz about it. The author of this book took pieces of her own family story and used them to put together this tale of a Jewish family in Atlantic City. It's the summer of 1934, and tragedy strikes in the very first chapter. It was so surprising seeing what would have been the climax in any other book happen immediately in this one. I mentioned this in my Goodreads review as well, which I've been posting more over there if you want to check out my profile. But it was kind of like seeing a comedian start off a set with their very best joke. After that, they are forced to rise to the occasion. I was really impressed with how the author executed this book. There are seven unique character perspectives, and we hear from all seven in the exact same order three different times, once for each month of the summer of 1934, and it flows just flawlessly. It's a sad book, but the melancholy is really gentle, and it manages to be relaxing and summery in spite of the fact that it is so sad. I don't know how she managed to pull anything in this book off, but she really did. It's so impressive for a debut. I will definitely be reading more from her if she writes more books. I really recommend this one. Next, I read a very popular book, Perfume, The Story of a Murderer by Patrick Suskind. This is the life story of a Frenchman who is born with a remarkably good sense of smell. He uses this for various purposes throughout his life, but he ends up, as the subtitle suggests, using his gift to murder young women in order to extract their scent. I've been trying to think of the best way to describe the writing in this book, and lusciously grotesque is what I came up with. Smells both good and bad are described so elegantly in this book, it's almost impossible not to feel yourself smelling them. But this man has some very serious problems probably stemming from the near constant rejection he faces throughout his life. I had a lot of internal moral conflict going on when I was reading this one because it is a beautifully written book, but it is one of those ones that you feel kind of weird about liking it because this man is so awful. It was a very strange experience reading this book, but it will definitely be memorable. I'll give it that. And before anyone asks, yes, I did watch the movie adaptation of this one as well. My husband was watching portions of it with me. He was just kind of in and out of the room while I was watching it. And he even likes weird off the wall things. He's a Twin Peaks fan, if that puts anything into perspective. And even he thought this was really weird. So there's that. Then a popular nonfiction book I read during the month of July was The Tiger by John Valiant. This book tells the true story of a man-eating tiger in Siberia. This tiger was terrorizing a region of the Russian taiga, and so investigators came in to track it. They were hoping to figure out why it was attacking people. That's not a typical thing for tigers to do. And they were also hoping to stop it from attacking people the nicest way to put that. I knew this one took place in Russia, but I was really pleasantly surprised at how much information on Russia the author provided to give context to this story. I just wasn't expecting it. It was a really nice surprise. So I really liked that element of it. And then the writing in here is so good. He took a really crazy story and made it even more compelling. 
Very impressive. Another story of vengeance, I read Jane Steele by Lindsay Fay, which is a thriller loosely based on Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. The character of Jane Steele in this book loosely follows in her idol Jane Eyre's footsteps. She goes off to school and has a very negative experience and then eventually becomes a governess and develops feelings for the man of the house. However, there is one big difference between Jane Steele and Jane Eyre. Jane Steele is capable of murder and proves it five times over. I don't know what I was expecting from this book, but this ended up being so different than whatever idea I had of it in my head, especially the section where she becomes a governess. There's this whole big mystery element to it that I would say transcends the mystery in Jane Eyre in terms of its complexity and the number of characters involved. I really enjoyed this book, but the meta presence of Jane Eyre was really strange for me. Like Jane Steele, the character, loves the book Jane Eyre. She talks about it all the time. But then she fails to mention the blatant similarities between her story and Jane Eyre's story or the shared names between the two stories. Like if she loves it so much, why doesn't she highlight that? That definitely knocked it down a star for me. I also buddy read The Word Exchange by Elena Graydon with the wonderful Tori Morrow. Highly suggest you check out her channel if you haven't already. Great stuff there. But this book is essentially a sci-fi book for word nerds. Our main character Anna works at a dictionary where her father is in charge. But then one day, without warning, her father disappears, not just from her life, but also his dictionary entry is gone. She starts getting clues that her father's disappearance might have something to to do with an emerging word virus being spread by mobile devices that are manufactured by an insidious corporate entity. It's a very strange mashup of a book. The father-daughter relationship and the father's disappearance really reminded me of The Unseen World by Liz Moore. The highbrow intellectual element to it was very reminiscent of Special Topics in Calamity Physics by Marisha Pessel. And then the whole time, the technology aspect of it made me really feel like I was watching the movie the Minority Report. I was really enjoying this book for the first third of it, but then as we approached the midway point, it really started to drag. It felt like by that point, the main mystery had all but been revealed, so we were getting nitty gritty details for kind of no reason, since you kind of already knew what was going on. Also, several Goodreads reviewers, as well as Tori, noticed while we were reading this book that there is some seriously elevated language in here. I liked that for a few different reasons, one of which is just I'm really nerdy, but I can see how that would be off-putting as you're going through this book having to look up words every three seconds. So as good as this one started, by the end it ended up being a meh one, unfortunately. The last book I'll discuss at length in this wrap-up is The Book of Night Women by Marlon James. This is the life story of Lilith, a slave on a Jamaican plantation. What I wasn't expecting from this book, from all of the different summaries I read of it ahead of reading it, as I do with most books, is that this is effectively a coming-of-age story, only a really brutal one of a girl who's forced to become accustomed to really horrific circumstances and conditions. As the book goes forward and we go forward with Lilith and her life, we see how much danger she's in basically constantly. We learn more about her first unknown parentage and then we see the really big consequences of her decisions. As I said, this book was really brutal and really hard to read during certain portions of it, but it's definitely as powerful as everyone says it is. Now, I have talked about the following books elsewhere, so I will only briefly mention them in this wrap up. The first of those is my classic pick for the month, which was Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. This is a classic adventure tale of three individuals who make their way inside a dormant volcano in Iceland, hoping to reach the center of the earth. I adored the opening section to this book. I thought it was hysterically funny and I couldn't get enough of it. But then we reached the adventure portion, which I actually liked substantially less. It was the opposite of what I was expecting. However, I did watch the Wishbone episode that adapted this book and discussed it in my ongoing series all about Wishbone. I will link that video for you up in the cards and down in the description box below. If you would like to see Wishbone wear an adorable pair of glasses and see some truly god-awful CGI. 
This month I also did a blog post on my blog, allofthebooks.com, in which I talked about the music that I listen to while I'm reading books sometimes, book soundtracks if you will, and in that post I discussed the music that Hotel Scarface by Robin Farzad inspired me to listen to. This book is essentially a history of the cocaine scene in Miami from the late 1970s through the mid-1980s, and how this hotel, the Hotel Mutiny, was a hot spot for big players in the game. It is an unbelievable story and it is told really well here. I just personally found that way too much space was given to covering the trials at the end of this book. I really wasn't all that interested and I found that I gained more knowledge about the scene in general from watching the documentary Cocaine Cowboys. I actually preferred it. But regardless, I will link my blog post down in the description box below if you would like to hear what my soundtrack for this book was. And then finally I read the final three books in the Nine Realms series by Sarah Kozlov. There was The Queen of Raiders, A Broken Queen, and The Cerulean Queen. I have been referring to the Nine Realms series, which begins with A Queen in Hiding, as Uprooted meets Game of Thrones, or Uprooted meets A Song of Ice and Fire, if we're using the correct series title. It is a sweeping series with a big, well thought out world and story. I had my problems with it, but I will say that I've been missing it so much in my life since I finished reading it. I will have to revisit these books at some point in the future, and I will definitely be reading anything else she writes. If you would like to hear all of my non-spoilery thoughts on this series, I will link my video review down in the description box below and up in the cards for you. So those were all the books I finished during the month of July. I would love to hear from you if you've read any of these books, if you've heard of any of them, or if you're now interested in reading them after hearing me discuss them, you can put that or any more general comments or questions you may have down in the comment section below. But if you'd prefer to find me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media, and you can find the link to my profiles in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.